All right, we are going to be t uh, picking up now with attendance issues and how they should be handled with the, uh, under the ADA and the FMLA. Now let's just talk about uh, attendance. Uh, obviously, uh, you need an employee to be at work if they're performing the essential functions of their job. And it has been an issue in the courts about whether an attendance can be, attendance can be an essential function of the job. Uh, in large part, when the ADA was first passed, uh, almost every court found that regular and predictable attendance was an essential function of the job. That has come into question uh, more recently, and some of the cases that I will be covering will uh, will explain why that has become more questionable in the in the more recent environment. One particular case that came out of the Ninth Circuit uh, in 2012 involved a uh, intensive care nurse who had sought an accommodation due to fibromyalgia, and she basically stated that this particular condition would have uh, required her to have an unspecified number of unplanned absences from her job. Now, this is a little different than what we talked about in the last session when we talked about inflexible leave policies, because this employee was not asking for a large block of time to deal with a particular medical condition. She was asking for an unspecified number of unplanned absences from her job. She had sought an exemption from the employer's attendance policy. Uh, the, the employer's policy allowed her up to five unplanned absences of unlimited duration, as well as other permitted absences. Of course, due to her condition, she had a chronic attendance problems, and the employer terminated her employee, uh, her employment. And she sued under the ADA. And particularly when we talk about an intensive care nurse, obviously that's not something that you can do away from the hospital. And obviously when you're dealing with trying to deal with ill patients, and the employer had no, I mean the court had no difficulty in finding that regular uh, and predictable attendance was an essential function of the job of an intensive care nurse, and particularly focusing on the safety uh, and the uh, patient uh, health that the individual was jeopardizing by uh, suggesting that the employer uh, should have accommodated her uh, unplanned absences and, uh, and uh, the unspecified number of unplanned absences that she uh, may be required to have due to her medical condition. Now, one of the things that was not covered in this particular case that the employer, uh, and I don't know the employer didn't do this, but what would be required if you were faced in a similar situation because uh, as an intensive care nurse, she was obviously, uh, ne the employer obviously needed to be able to count on her and could not provide this particular accommodation that she had requested, but the employer would have been required to see if there was a vacant position within the hospital that met her qualifications and still was able to accommodate her need to have those unspecified need, uh, number of, unspec of unplanned absences and that, uh, so as part of the uh, of the uh, reasonable accommodation uh, equation, and, and if the employer did have such a vacant position, would be required to consider her for that position. Uh, reassignment as an ADA uh, reasonable accommodation, uh, just continuation of what I was just saying, uh, dealing with a case out of the Seventh Circuit in 2012 and involved United Airlines. In this particular case, the, the uh, airline did not guarantee, guarantee reassignment to disabled employees, even if they were qualified for that uh, that particular position and the reassignment did not pose an undue hardship. And when an individual who did have a disability competed for that vacant position, then um, it, then um, uh, she had re she refused that uh, the the airline refused uh, her request for that vacant position, and she sued under or the EEOC, EEOC sued, on, sued on her behalf under the ADA. And the court held that the ADA required an employer to appoint disabled employee to vacant positions for which they were minimally qualified, unless doing so would be unreasonable and impose an undue hardship upon the company. Uh, the big issue when we talk about reassignments to vacant positions uh, does come into whether you have, uh, where individuals may have to uh, to bid for particular positions, whether you may have a collective bargaining position in place. Do have uh, you know some split or diff and some wrinkles, if you will, that do occur when we talk about reassignments to uh, vacant positions. Uh, mandated reassignment, the courts have a split on this a little bit. Uh, the Tenth Circuit and D.C. Circuits follow the mandatory preference review. 
meaning that they have to be absolutely offered that vacant position. The Eighth Circuit uh, requires that they have an opportunity to compete for that vacant position. And uh, the Seventh Circuit has reversed prior pre precedent uh, following um, their rulings that a, a disabled in individual had to have the opportunity to compete for uh, a particular position. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court had an opportunity to resolve this dispute in a 2007 case, but the Supreme Court uh, did not do so because the case had been uh, had been settled prior to any decision. When we talk about reassignment, it does uh, it becomes a little bit of a problem uh, when we do talk about other individuals who may also be qualified for that particular job. Do keep in mind that reassignment is not available to applicants. You when talk about reassignment, you're also not required to promote them into a position that is not uh, a, considered a reasonable accommodation. You're only required to reassign them to lateral or lower positions. If you do reassign them to a lower position, you do not have to pay them uh, what you were paying them at their uh, at their higher position. You pay the, the regular rate for the position that you reassign them to. Reassignment is always an accommodation of last resort, uh, and you're always you, uh, focusing first on whether there are reasonable accommodations that do allow them to perform the essential functions of the job that they have with your organization and only focus on reassignment when you have exhausted all possibilities and the only thing you can look to is reassignment as that possible accommodation. And again, don't forget your undue hardship arguments. You always want to consider the implications of reassigning lesser qualified employees and even the impact that you may that it may have on coworkers or customers. Uh, and we do look at uh, sometimes the morale issues that co coworkers uh, may have due to the fact that they think that someone may be getting preferential treatment that would not be otherwise available to them. Uh, telecommuting uh, has also been a more recent a hot button issue for the EEOC and as well as for the courts, particularly when we talk about attendance being an essential function of a job. Uh, the courts now recognize that with the technology that we all have, that individuals are able to perform a significant amount of work away from uh, the office, if you will. And in particular situations, obviously it doesn't work in every scenario, but the courts are saying that we cannot just automatically assume that telecommuting is uh, considered an undue hardship, and we do need to focus on whether uh, the uh, we need to focus on the job at hand, and whether the individual can still perform the essential functions of that job uh, from home with with the availability of a, commu uh, a computer or the like. Uh, the EEOC case that you see in your materials uh, dealt with a suit that was brought against Ford Motor Company, where the uh, where the uh, the individual who was a resale steel buyer asked to telecommute up to four days per week to accommodate her irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, the company denied her request, arguing that the essential function of her job was group problem solving. And that obviously can be an essential function of a large number of jobs, which would obviously not be a situation that frequent that would allow itself to be working from home. But the court, uh, you know, the district court did say that you know, group problem solving required you to be at the office and therefore granted summary judgment to the company on the accommodation claim. And in a 2-1 decision, uh, the Sixth Circuit reversed that particular uh, decision. And the courts, the Sixth Circuit focused on the fact that uh, we can no longer say that presence at the work site is an essential function of the job and noted that telecommuting might be a reasonable accommodation and of course focusing on the fact that we, given the state of modern technology, we can no longer just jump to the conclusion that telecommuting might be an extraordinary or unusual accommodation. Going into more of the interplay with the ADA and the FMLA, keep in mind that a request for FMLA leave or a request for accommodation under the ADA uh, may also may, may trigger review under uh, the other statutes. So if you look at a request for leave under the FMLA, you may also be looking at a request for leave under the ADA and vice versa. And again, uh, you know, uh, since the amendments, we are focusing more on the accommodation aspect rather than whether someone actually meets that definition of disability. Let's talk a little bit about an employer's response to FMLA and the abuse or dishonesty situation uh, in this particular case the, out of 2013. 
and you know, I think that one of the biggest issues that employers do have is, particularly with intermittent leave, uh, is uh, the feeling that someone is abusing the situation, uh, that they are taking a lot of leave that uh, is not necessarily uh, dealing with their uh, particular uh, condition. They also are concerned that when they see things like pictures on Facebook when they're supposed to be on a leave of absence, and they see pictures where they are out on a vacation or the like. Uh, this particular case that came out of uh, the di uh, district court in Michigan dealt with an employee who was on a, an approved FMLA leave with a back and leg injury. She posted pictures of herself vacationing in Vancouver. She was riding on a motorboat, lying on a bed, holding up two bottles of beer, and was even holding up her infant children. Uh, she sued under the FMLA when the employer uh, said that uh, you were dishonest with us and therefore uh, we are terminating your employment, and she sued, claiming that the employer had retaliated against her and interfered with her right uh, to the FMLA leave. With regard to the abuse and dishonesty, the court found that the uh, employer was able to uh, to terminate him, her employment as long as the employer had an honest belief that the employee had been dishonest with that uh, with uh, the employer. Be careful when you do have to, uh, physician certifications under the FMLA that someone cannot perform the essential functions of their job, even with even with evidence that would suggest that the individual has been dishonest. Uh, there are have been courts that said that when you have a medical certification, that uh, you you have to rely on that medical certification. You may take such evidence like the pictures and, and ask the uh, physician to reevaluate the situation, but uh, you should not be going behind uh, the medical certification. And also courts have also recognized that just because an individual is unable to perform the essential functions of your job does not mean that they would be unable to work at another place where the essential functions may be different or they may even be able to take a vacation because sometimes uh, what may be recommended to them is to uh, relieve their stress or whatever uh, for them to go and take a vacation where it, where you're thinking while wow, they're, they're just getting a vacation uh, and not really dealing with their medical condition, but that may be something that was actually prescribed to them. Another case that came out of uh, the Western District of, P of uh, Pennsylvania, excuse me, uh, the employee was terminated for failing to stay close to home when she was receiving paid disability benefits. The, uh, union, the employer union had adopted a wage replacement policy requiring its recipients to stay in the immediate vicinity of their homes with certain exceptions. Uh, two weeks into her FMLA leave, she went to Cancun uh, for a week and uh, the court did uphold her termination. Uh, the, what was going on here was the court was upholding her termination uh, due to the requirement that she stay in the immediate vicinity of her home. Courts have also uphold, upheld employer policies where an employer would, uh, the policy prohibits an employee from moonlighting or working at another job while on a leave of absence and that would not be considered a violation of the FMLA. of uh, the Sixth Circuit came out in 2012. This is dealing with an employee who was terminated for failing to comply with provisions of a paid disability plan requiring co uh, cooperation and in providing information and returning to work uh, to perform light duty. Uh, this is an issue, this is dealing with a little bit more of the interaction between FMLA and workers' comp law. Uh, with regard to workers' comp law, uh, you will have adjusters who will ask you to put an employee back on light duty. And keep in mind, workers' comp and FMLA can be run concurrently. And, uh, and you will inevitably have a, an adjuster who will ask you to return someone to light duty uh, to cut down your workers' comp liability. If an individual is unable to return to work and perform the essential functions of their job and they still have 12 weeks available to them or have any other leave available to them under the FMLA, you cannot uh, terminate them or discipline them for refusing a light duty position because the FMLA does give them that automatic protection as long as they are unable to perform the essential functions of their job. Now they may lose their benefits under workers' compensation, but you would not be able to take any adverse action against them uh, as long as you know, a physician has not indicated, as long as a physician has stated that there are restrictions that would be placed upon them if they return to work. 
Going back to the Sixth Circuit case, the plaintiff had refused to perform part-time sed uh, sedentary temporary restrictive work for as few as two hours a day, and her doctor had stated that uh, he was unable to work. Based on the doctor's input, input, he continued to receive paid benefits under a paid disability plan without having to perform any light duty, and he remained on, on FMLA leave, which he was entitled to do because, again, the doctor had stated that he was unable to work uh, and except to uh, perform this part-time sedentary uh, temporary restricted duty, which the plaintiff had refused, and the plaintiff was uh, allowed to do that. Uh, four days after the doctor, however, stated that he was unable to do any work, he had attended a public Oktoberfest festival for approximately 90 minutes and was terminated at that point for violating the terms of the paid disability plan. Again, this was applying that plan consistently without regard to why someone was on a paid disability, whether it was because of FMLA or some other type of condition that would not be FMLA qualifying. So the court had no problem in finding that there was no FMLA interference or retaliation claim. However, if the employer had terminated the employee, we'll take the Oktoberfest festival situation out of the scenario, but if the employer had terminated the employee because that employee had refused that part-time sedentary uh, temporary restricted duty that uh, the her physician said that she could perform, then uh, or even that the you know, that if the physician said she could perform it, that the employer would have uh, violated the FMLA because her physician had not uh, 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 had not released her to return to work full duty. Dealing with another case out of the Sixth Circuit, uh, dealing with Federal Express. This is an important case to, uh, that everyone needs to know. When we talk about the physician certifications and reporter requirements to get one, it's something you're entitled to have under the FMLA. Uh, you're not required to get it, but you are entitled to get it. Uh, it is not something that's written into the ADA, but it is definitely written into the FMLA. In this particular case, it dealt with the regulation that states that if you are asking for a uh, medical certification, you must uh, tell the employee that they have 15 days to return it to you, and you must also tell them the consequences for the failure to return that to you. Uh, but that communication to that employee must be in writing, and that's what that's what uh, where FedEx fell down on this particular case. The employee had re had not returned the medical certification to the employer within that 15 uh, days. The there was no question that the employer had orally communicated the need to the employee to return it within 15 days, but the employer had not put it in writing, and the court said that it needed to be in writing, and the court also was significantly focusing on the fact that this particular employee had a mental condition, and uh, therefore the court found that trying to hold her to the knowledge of what was communicated to her orally uh, was undermining or was a uh, was not taking into account the seriousness of a uh, mental uh, underlying mental disorder. Uh, 